You don't get to discover a tool that changes how you work every day. Sometimes it's the little things that are simple yet genius that have the most effect. Dear Env is one of those tools. On its surface, it is regarded as a dot profile decluttering solution, meaning it can load and unload environment variables for you on the fly depending on the path, saving you the need to configure huge lists of variables in your dot zshrc or dot bashrc that will bloat your environment but won't really be used most of the time. This is a cool idea, but for me, it's way beyond just that. To me, DRNV is a security tool and an isolated environment manager. It takes care of my configurations and local settings, making sure to load and unload exactly what's needed and nothing else. Combined with Git's best yet unknown feature, DRNV becomes a lifesaver. Think of an employee walking around a chocolate factory with his badge. Every time he walks into a room, the badge automatically assumes the secret keys to operate chocolate machines or whatever is in a chocolate factory room, but only the machines behind the door he just went through. As soon as the employee leaves the room, the badge loses the keys. This way, if a machine is taken out of the room or the employee walks into a similar machine on another area that produces, I don't know, different kind of chocolate, he won't accidentally use a global configuration and hurt the production process. I think I went too far with the Willy Wonka analogy, so let's jump in and take a closer look into DRNV. I'm going to start with my new favorite way of installing packages. Nix Env. A critical step after installing DRNV is to remember to load it into your shell. If you're on Z shell, run the Eva line like so, or use bash at the end or other supported shells. Don't forget to append it to your .zshrc or other .profile for the automation to persist. If you're an oh my ZSH, like most of my Z shell viewers, know that DRNV is a known plugin and you can simply add it to your list, like so, instead of evaluating the hook. Either way, once that's out of the way, with a quick test of the CLI, we can start working. Most developers will be familiar with the .env file, usually a key value pair of environment variables required for a successful local process run. Most users will also probably have something along the lines of an export command preceding the key value pairs, and then a script or a manual run of eval and then cut.env command. DRENV, on the other hand, works with a .envrc file a dot file for dot env, if you will. The moment such a file is detected, DRENV fires up. By default, it's blocked from all paths. If I search my SOM key in the environment, it's empty. Once explicitly allowed, using DRENV allow, it will load the dot envrc file. Trying the environment variable now shows it in the environment. Every process I start now will have this config available. If I move out of the directory, DRENV immediately unloads the environment. Let's make sure this is the case and see that some key is in fact empty. Every time I step back into the permitted path with a .envrc, I will be greeted with a new environment load message. For a configurable prompt users like myself, this becomes even more powerful. I love my Starship prompt, more on that in the link above. Starship detects my AWS profile, for example, and presents it based on the variable existence. This way, I can make sure it's present in the .envrc and presented in my prompt only when it's relevant. Like in this instance, when deploying my bot to AWS. Like earlier, moving out of the directory, DRENV unloads and Starship detects the change. The profile is now out of sight. You gotta love how things play together so nicely. In my Git repo, just like .env should be ignored and not committed, so does .envrc. I'll add it to my list of ignored files. When my status shows .envrc is gone, I'll just commit the change and confirm the ignore rule. Bear in mind, I'm not doing that because of secrets. Secrets should not be in your .env files, but knowing my audience and other less elegant practices, it's best to be cautious and make sure end variables aren't part of the repo. I'll back this claim up even further. Have you heard of 12-factor apps? This is a kind of a manifesto or a list of instructions for building better applications, built with modern environments in mind like cloud platforms, container orchestrators, etc. I highly recommend you read through it, but here's the gist of it. It has 12 rules or factors to build fast, efficient, low cost, low maintenance applications for maximum portability. It mentions running short cycles of automated deployments, meaning every push to a repo automatically gets deployed using CI like the deployment job I have here. It describes managing dependencies, like I'm using my Go modules and the Go sum log file. You may be familiar with similar files from other languages like the package.json file in JavaScript and its companion, the package log. Number three on the list, and the most important one for us, is config. 
it says that apps should not store any configuration in the code. This is a violation of 12 factor. Config should wrap the application from the outside using something like a .env file for variables and secrets management for sensitive information. I'm going to give you a mini solution for sensitive information later on, so stick around till the end. The 12 factor list goes on with other settings like disposability, dev prod parity, and process management, which I use a multi phase Docker container to handle most. More on that in a video coming up next month, so make sure you're subscribed. Now that we covered 12 factor applications, you have a better understanding of why a well configured process is so important. As I mentioned in the beginning, I've been loving DRENV because it makes even better sense in my workflow when I'm using Git's best feature, WorkTrees. There's a video linked above covering how I work with it, but essentially I have a bare repo, in this case fatbot.git, and different work trees in the form of subdirectories within it. I've got the main branch aligned with my production environment, and I'll add dev as another example branch. This way I can keep one NVRC file for production and another one for all other branches to prevent mistakes. This aligns perfectly with the 12-factor app rule of dev prod parity. I even have different AWS regions for better separation using two different profile names. Keep this in mind if you like work trees or consider giving work trees a try. I promise you'll love them. Let's go back to DRENV. You may have seen the red warning over and over alarming me I should reallow the path when a .nvrc file changes. This is a security feature and can be solved in two ways. The second one is way cooler in my opinion, but let's start with the obvious. DRENV provides with an edit subcommand, like kubectl if you're a Kubernetes user, where it finds a local .nvrc, loads it into your editor, which is NeoVim of course, and if you add an example sum equals thing pair, then when you save it, it'll get permitted automatically and you can see my sum key added to the end of the list, which is also present in the environment. As always, keep in mind that the man pages are your friend and always available. I promised a second, cooler solution to the reload and allow sequence. Check this out. And this is where DRM actually gets generally way better. Not only it automates loading and unloading variables, it also comes with its own standard library. Since it's being loaded into every .nvrc run, you can use the new syntax here. One such option is .env, a keyword that when loaded as part of a devrc file, will look for a local .env file and load it. My .nvrc holds only a .env keyword at the moment. My .env holds the variable sum, this time with a value in uppercase letters to make sure it works. And there it is in my environment, no need to re-permit the path. I can write another variable directly into .env and have it immediately load, no questions asked. This is also a great option if you're already managing a large .env file and you don't want to port everything into your .nvrc. Just mention .env and let it do its thing. The standard library doesn't end there. It has tons of other options like the has function, checking if a tool exists before making decisions. But my all-time favorite is env vars required. This thing quite literally lets you program the environment for other users. If AWS profile and DB endpoint, for example, are missing, it'll pop a warning for both. Adding AWS profile will remove one warning and adding the DB endpoint will solve both. Most applications do these checks in the code, where it's not necessarily the best place. DRENV saves you the trouble of running these pre-flight checks in the first place. You can view the DRENV STD lib by literally running DRENV STD lib, and you can also pipe it to NVIM to read it in a nicer editor. This is where you can see something like .env, for example, how the function is implemented in Bush. Before wrapping things up, I promised a way to handle secrets. Now I'll say this once more. Don't use secrets in your .env or .nvrc file. However, if you must, or you have something that's somewhat sensitive, you can try giving .nvx a go. For the most part, .nvx handles environment like DRENV, but slightly different. Instead of loading and unloading variables to a path, .nvx loads them into a process. This makes things safer if used in production, and while you can use it, I'm showing it here for a different capability. Encryption. Install it using your preferred method in the docs, and once installed, to add encryption on an existing .env file, which we now create with our SOM key, run .nvx encrypt. You'll notice that it says it encrypted our env file and added a private key into .env.keys. 
Taking a look at .env now holds a public key and an encrypted value of the var added. This makes the file safe, even if pushed remotely. I don't suggest you do, but if you do, nothing serious happens. What is dangerous though, is if you forget to ignore this file in git. .env.keys holds your private key, used to encrypt the current variables and all future ones. To test it, I created a small application that reads an environment variable named SOM. Simply running it returns an empty string since SOM is not both in the environment and encrypted. Even if we use something like direnv to load it by creating a .envrc file that loads .env, we run the app again and all we see is the encrypted unusable values. Here's where the magic happens. .envx run minus minus and the application process, which in my case is go run main, prints thing, our decrypted variable value. We can add another encrypted variable using the .envx set command with key and value directly into .env. If we ask the app to read hello as well and run it, both variables, although encrypted, are loaded, then decrypted and printed successfully. Dear Env is genius, and it makes my life so much easier when working with my open source projects by saving my dot profile config files from clutter and secrets. But how do you actually manage these dot files? How do you make sure they're safe? backed up and easily shared across other environments and machines. How do you safely push them remotely and share them with others? And also, why would you even want to do that? I tried answering all of these and many more in the .files from scratch video right here. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.